My ferment is too salty. Help! What do I do? I'll be answering that question along with many others regarding ferments that I've received from my sweet viewers. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest, where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferments, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Well, what I've got here is fermented red cabbage. And I've made a video showing you how to make this, and I'll be sure to link it in the iCards and in the description below. But I wanted to make a follow-up video because I get a lot of questions about ferments. And I would say that when it comes to traditional foods, probably the one area that I get the most questions about is ferments. And that's completely understandable because as I've shared with you many times, ferments are very persnickety. Now the term fermentation really is a big umbrella. You have vegetable ferments like this, you also have sourdough starter, and you also have cultured dairy, and other things that all come under the fermentation umbrella. Now I also do get a lot of questions about sourdough starter, and I have a very detailed video on where I go over uh, start to finish how to make a sourdough starter, and I address a lot of questions and a lot of um, dealing with problems that may arise and how to handle them, how to correct them, so on and so forth. And I'll definitely link to that in the iCards and in the description below. But even more so than sourdough starter, I get more questions about ferments. I get some about cultured dairy, but not as much. So today we're just going to focus on, on fermenting vegetables. And of all the questions that I get about fermented vegetables, the number one question is it tastes so salty what did i do wrong how do i fix it and so on and so forth now when it comes to fermenting vegetables you generally want about a two to three percent salinity meaning the percentage of salt to water in your ferment or salt to vegetables in your ferment so for example when we made this red cabbage I had a three pound cabbage, so in order to have a 2% salinity, we wanted about an ounce of salt. And that's a general rule of thumb, uh, to have that about 2% to 3% for vegetables. Now, pickles tend to fall into their own category. When you take cucumbers and you're making pickles, in order for them to be nice and tasty and nice and crisp, in addition to adding tannins, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, the salinity for making pickles, uh, the weight of the pickle in, in uh, relationship to how much salt you use, is generally about 5%. But I don't want you to get worried. You don't need to start weighing everything. I've done a lot of calculations for you uh, in terms of the recipes that you can uh, print out on my website and uh, definitely check the description below where I'll have direct links that'll take you over to how to make red cabbage, how to make pickles, so on and so forth. But generally, two tablespoons of a coarse ground sea salt, whether that's the Celtic sea salt, the Redmond real salt, the Himalayan pink salt, you know, I get a lot of questions, what type of salt? As long as it's not a processed salt that has caking agents in it, you're fine. Any real salt will work for fermentation. And about two tablespoons of a coarse ground sea salt weigh about one ounce. And if you're using a fine ground sea salt, then it's about one tablespoon. And over time, when you start to learn how to ferment, you'll start to get a feel for how much your vegetables weigh. When you go to buy cabbage to make sauerkraut, you can weigh it on the scale at your grocery store and get a feel for that the uh, head of cabbage you've got may weigh about three pounds and so you're going to need two tablespoons of a coarse ground sea salt in order to ferment it in your jar. 
And even though the rule is somewhere between 2% to 3% salinity for doing something like a sauerkraut, I usually uh, lean to the 2%. I found that sufficient. It creates a nice ferment with a good taste and a good crunch. But often when people are new to making ferments, they will check their ferment after a few days. It's starting to bubble and they're thinking, oh, should I get ready to refrigerate this? And they go to taste it. And that's when the emails start coming in or the comments underneath the video. Oh my goodness, this is so salty. And yes, in the beginning, your ferment is going to taste very salty. Even after seven to 14 days, which can sometimes, it can take that long uh, for sauerkraut to reach or, or for cabbage to reach the level of being sauerkraut that you like and it can taste very salty during that process. But what happens over time, once you go and refrigerate your ferment, is that the cabbage begins to absorb more of the brine and it becomes tastier and your brine becomes less salty. And in absorbing that brine and spreading it throughout the cabbage, you no longer have that very strong salty taste. Instead, you have a very flavorful sauerkraut. And any lingering brine that you now have in your sauerkraut that may be clinging to the vegetable when you go to taste it is less salty because a lot of that brine has been absorbed by the vegetable, in this case, the cabbage. So I want to reassure you, don't panic if in the first few days or the first week or even the first two weeks, your ferment is very soft, uh, very soft, very salty. We don't want it to be too soft. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But don't worry, it's not going to be too salty over time. It's going to mellow, it's going to be very rich in probiotics, and it's going to be very tasty. Next, Talking about crispiness, I get a lot of questions, both in email and comments, that says, my ferment is so mushy, I can't stand it. What went wrong? And yes, ferments can get mushy, but there's a way to prevent it. Now, when you make sauerkraut, it's not really a problem. Sauerkraut, by the nature of the cabbage, tends to stay relatively crisp, but with some softness, and you want some softness when it comes to sauerkraut. So generally, I don't get that question when it comes to sauerkraut. Where I see it more often is if people are making pickles, or if they're making the jardiniera mix, the, the mixed vegetables, the mixed fermented vegetables, the carrots, and so on and so forth. There's a very easy solution to this problem. They're the perfect way to keep your ferments crisp is to add tannins. You want to put tannins in your jar with your salted brine. And where can you find tannins? From something very simple that's probably in your pantry, a tea bag. You're just going to put your tea bag in the bottom of your jar. You're going to put in your vegetables, put in your salt, add in your water, and you're good to go. Now, what type of tea? A simple black tea bag. It can be a caffeinated black tea bag or it can be a decaffeinated black tea bag. It doesn't matter. You're just looking for the tannins that are in tea, which are both in caffeinated and decaffeinated. And you just need one tea bag uh, for a quart size jar or even a half gallon jar. One black tea bag will be sufficient. And if you don't have any black tea bags, but you have green tea, you can use green tea too. The only difference is green tea has less tannins, so you'll want to use two tea bags. Now, there are many other things that contain tannins, but I always find that tea bags are the easiest to uh, have in the home pantry. Uh, they're easy to find at the supermarket and they work really well. Uh, and they're reasonable. You can also use bay leaves, but if you use bay leaves, keep in mind that bay does have a flavor that may impart into your ferment and they're more costly. I find that the tea really doesn't affect the brine very much and really doesn't impart any flavor that's noticeable and they just work so well. And as I said, they're so reasonable. 
uh, but yes, you can use bay leaves. And if you live near a vineyard, like I live in the Texas Hill Country, we have a lot of vineyards here. And grape leaves uh, are very high in tannins. So if you do have uh, access to a winery and you can get some grape leaves, you can certainly uh, use those uh, to put into your ferment. Now, another question that I get a lot is, do I really need to use salt? I'm on a salt restricted diet or I don't really like to use salt or, or I have high blood pressure or whatever the case may be. And people will say, I don't want to use salt. How can I make a ferment without salt? Well, there are a couple of options available to you. If you're willing to or can, for whatever reason you have, go low salt, you can decrease your salt by adding whey. And that's where you strain yogurt or kefir, whatever the case may be, and you get acidic whey. And you can put a quarter cup of whey and then one tablespoon of your coarse ground sea salt, uh, you know, again, to get that sort of 2% salinity that you're looking for where the whey is not really uh, helping with the saline solution, so to speak, but because it's very rich in good bacteria, it helps kickstart that fermentation process. So you can lower the salinity of the overall ferment by putting half the amount based on the, the weight that you're estimating that you have in terms of vegetables. So for going back to our example of the red cabbage, with the three pound red cabbage, rather than using two tablespoons of the coarse ground sea salt, you would just use one tablespoon of the coarse ground sea salt and a quarter cup of acidic whey. However, and this is going to be personal preference, I find that whey can sometimes impart a little bit of a milky flavor to ferments. Now, it may just be my palate being a little more uh, attuned to it or something. Everybody's palate is different. So experiment with that and see what you think. But the nice thing about using whey as opposed to just using salt is whey is an insurance policy. It's almost going to guarantee that your ferment is going to do very well because, as I said, it's rich in good bacteria and it's going to kickstart the fermentation process. So if you're new to fermenting, it can be a nice option for you. Another option is if you have previous ferments, you can take a quarter cup of the brine from a previous ferment and then half the salt uh, and put that into your jar, just like we did with the whey. The whey and the brine from a previous ferment would be interchangeable. So you could use whey or you could use brine from a previous ferment and then half the salt. You could also experiment with just using brine from a previous ferment. Now, that would have some salt in it. Uh, however, the salt really does play a role in ferments. It taps down the bad bacteria and it does help with the flavor and the crispiness of the vegetables that you're fermenting. So that is something to keep in the back of your mind when you decide to cut back on the salt. But you could experiment and see if using the brine from a previous ferment uh, achieved the results you were looking for with less salt. But what about a completely salt-free option? There is such a thing, and I highly recommend two books, and they're both by Sander Katz, and he's sort of the king of fermentation. Uh, one book I think is called Wild Fermentation, and I think the other book is The Art of Fermentation. And I'll be sure to put links to them in the description below. If you are interested in learning more about fermentation, I highly recommend these books. Wild Fermentation is just a little paperback, it's very reasonable, and it's perfect for the beginner. It's even going to give you more information than you could ever hope for even as a beginner. And it's a wonderful book and it, it covers everything basically uh, on the topic of fermentation. And, but if you want to go into real detail that's even beyond wild, the book Wild Fermentation, there's The Art of Fermentation, which is a big hardback book. And in that book, Sander goes into great 
detail, not just on vegetable ferments. He talks about all kinds of ferments. He talks about sourdough. He talks about cultured dairy. He talks about uh, fermenting things like soybean curd. Uh, so many things. He goes on to talk about beer and wine. It's very, very detailed. I mean, that's really, uh, uh, what's the word, tome? on fermentation. But if you're just getting started, wild fermentation is going to be fantastic for you. Well, in his books on fermentation, getting back to salt-free ferments, he discusses fermenting with seeds. Now, I have not fermented with seeds because I really like to use salt and or salt and brine from a previous ferment. But Sander discusses using things like celery seeds, caraway seeds, and so on and so forth, and putting those into your ferment in place of the salt. So if that's something that's interesting to you, be sure to check out his books for more details. Another common question I get is, does my ferment need to be refrigerated? Now there are different schools of thought on this. And also a lot may depend on where you live and how warm it really gets in your home. I live in Central Texas, so I am not comfortable leaving my ferments uh, at whatever would be considered room temperature in my home or in my garage. I don't have a cellar. I don't have a root cellar. So I am most comfortable putting my ferment into the refrigerator, usually on the top shelf, because the ideal storage temperature for ferments is about 40 degrees. And the general temperature in a refrigerator is usually about 38 degrees, and that's Fahrenheit, 38 degrees Fahrenheit. So I find putting ferments on the top shelf, you know, heat rises, cold falls, so that it's a little warmer on top than it is down on the bottom of my refrigerator, and I find that's a very good option. Some people like storing their ferments if you have like a little wine refrigerator. I gather you can adjust the temperatures on that, so that's another option. Now. Other people who have lived in cooler climates have told me that they've stored their ferments in the garage or in their cellar, or some people who are very lucky and have a root cellar will store them there. So yes, if a refrigerator is your only option, it can get pretty crowded if you make a lot of ferments. But again, depending on where you live and some options you may have in terms of your garage, your cellar, or a root cellar, there are other places that you can store your ferment. And the reason at some point, once your ferment is ready, that you want to have it in a cooler area than what would be considered like normal room temperature, maybe somewhere between 68 degrees Fahrenheit and 72 degrees Fahrenheit, is because you want to slow down the fermentation. If you leave it at room temperature for too long, it's going to keep fermenting. And even with tannins, even with salt, whatever the case may be, uh, it could become extremely soft or there are the potentials, depending on the, the warmth of the room, that even though the good bacteria may have taken hold, is there a potential that the bad bacteria may be able to somehow take a hold? That's always a possibility. You know, as I said, ferments are very persnickety. So once they're ready, you really do want to put them at a temperature that slows down fermentation and makes them happy and keeps the good bacteria able to proliferate slowly and keep your ferment nice and fresh and in good condition. Another really important question that I get from people who are new to fermentation is to how to know their ferment is okay. I'll get uh, sort of panicked emails sometimes saying, I'm so afraid, I don't want to make my family sick, and how do I know that it's 100% correct and healthy and okay to eat? And I understand that completely. Uh, not related to ferments, but I will share with you, the first time we were able to find raw milk here in Central Texas where we live, I drank the whole gallon myself before giving any to my son. My husband wasn't interested, but uh, I drank the whole gallon myself, and once I was alive and well, I was like, okay, I think this raw milk is going to be all right. But I, so I understand that question, and it, I really take it seriously. And I want to help you to, uh, on how to know that, yes, your ferment is okay. The good news is, 
fermentation like this, where you're keeping everything submerged under liquid, and then the, I don't know if you can see it, but if you've seen the video where I make this, I put in a little uh, canning jar. It's a four ounce jelly jar. You can also use one of those fermentation glass weights. So you're keeping everything submerged under the liquid and under pressure. And this is, as I said, an anaerobic fermentation, and it's a very acidic environment, or at least it becomes acidic as, as the uh, yeast start the process, then the good bacteria takes over, and then the lactic acid kicks in, which is what gives ferments that tangy flavor. And that lactic acid is making a very acidic environment. It's less likely for things that could uh, make us ill, like a botulism, to survive in very acidic environments. So what you want to know is, is my ferment at a pH of about 4.0? Because that's an acidic pH. Now, over time, when you become a regular uh, fermenter, uh, you'll be able to taste it and go, yes, this is the right tang, it's just the way I like it, and it definitely has a low pH. But in the beginning, to give yourself a level of comfort, you can buy these little pH strips. Sometimes they come in a little uh, round vessel where you pull one out. I just have these, it's like a little tape. I'll take a close-up picture so that you can see it. And they come in varying ranges. This has a very short range from 5.5 to 3.0. And for example, when I make homemade vinegar, and if that's something you're interested in, i definitely link to that in the iCards and in the description below. I like my vinegar really vinegary. And so I wait until it gets down to a 3.0. But generally, anything from a 4.0 or lower is going to be very acidic. So once you know you've gotten to a nice acidic environment, it's going to be ready and it's going to be healthy for you. It's going to be rich in probiotics and uh, your family's go, you're going to enjoy it, your family and friends are going to enjoy it, and you don't need to worry that it's somehow contaminated with bad bacteria. And what you can do is you can take these pH strips, they're yellow, and then you can just dip it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna want, I don't wanna take the weight out, so I'm just gonna kinda go around the jar there that I have in there, and then we're gonna pull that out. I'm just gonna put that on, it's bubbling nicely. And we will compare this because I, you know, as I, I took a close up shot of this that I'll overlay for you, and you can see that this goes from 3.0 to 5.5. And those are sort of very acidic -y, acidic -y <laughs> pHs. And anything lower than 4.0 is going to tell you that your ferment is ready and safe to eat. And 4.0 uh, is normally about where people will like their sauerkraut, for example, the best. So I took a, a close-up picture and I'm going to overlay it so that you can see about where this pH is falling. And it looks like it's kind of moving from 4.0 to about 3.5, which is definitely telling me that my ferment has reached a nice level of acidity that's going to be perfect. Now, some people are a little intrigued by these pH strips, and they'll say, well, Mary, you dipped it in something that's purple, and that was yellow, and now it's changed a little color, but how is that really a pH strip? Well, I'm going to show you. I'm going to dip the other end in just some plain water, and we're going to see what that does. See? It turns green. So the water is about at that 5.5 pH. So these pH strips can be very reassuring to the new fermenter. And I'll definitely put a link down below where you can find them. You can find them on Amazon, but also check you know, at the pharmacy area of your local grocery store or local drugstore. They usually sell pH strips too. And just make sure that when you get them, they e either uh, have the acid side of the pH scale or just the whole pH scale. Uh, but that way you at least know that you're going to have uh, pH strips that will go down to the 4.0, 4.0, 3.5, and 3.0. 
Well, those are the most common questions that I receive. But if you have any questions, be sure to leave them in the comments below, and I'd be so happy to answer them and help you with the fermentation process. And also, be sure to click on this video over here, which is my complete guide to fermentation. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.